How many veterans do we have in the audience? Stand up, please. Thank you to all the veterans here. As we know, veterans are, they're our real national treasure. And uh, everything we've got, we owe it to the veterans, which is one of the reasons why I enjoy being on the board of the Veterans Memorial. Uh, it combines two of the things I really always have enjoyed is veterans and parks, so it's kind of a natural for me. I would like to recognize uh, our past president emeritus, Travis Small, in the back. He's, he was one of the original members of the Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial Board. And uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I'm gonna have to more or less tell the truth, I guess, because <laughs> Travis, he, he's our historian on the board, that's for sure. Start off with this quote from George Washington. You've seen it before, it's still uh, as appropriate today as it was back in his day. And uh, you see this frequently, the issues relating to veterans, veterans health care, and, and all those other things. Uh, uh, the Brazos Valley Veterans Memorial, of course, is out at Veterans Park and Athletic Complex. How many of you have been out there? I would suspect most of you have, so it's, it's not like this is a new topic. Uh, one bit of trivia, and this is my trivia. Not really a question, but uh, this is a trivia answer. Uh, John Nichols is the person that came up with the idea to name this Veterans Park an athletic complex when he was on the parks board. And, you know, that was, uh, at the time, it was kind of a simple thing. We were trying to come up with a name for this new athletic park. It had nothing to do with veterans back then. It was for softball and soccer. And we decided that uh, the parks board wanted to name this before there was even anything out there. So it started to get an identity and would become recognizable. And we were searching for names like College Station Park number 53 or <laughs> College Station Athletic Park or something like that. And, and John's the one when we were sitting around the table, he said, why don't we name it for veterans? And that one suggestion, which turned into a reality, literally changed everything about that park. And, uh, you know, once that happened, I don't think we really realized where it was all going to go to, but uh, the end result you can see out there today. But thank you to John for his leadership and his continued leadership on the council. My, my main purpose was to have the word park in there too, right. because you wanted the athletic complex. <laughs> Not you, but others. Right. I said, it's also a park. And uh, when you think about that name, Veterans Park and Athletic Complex, it really combines two things uh, in terms of, you know, what we are. Uh, it, it honors and recognizes the service and sacrifice of our veterans. And at the same time, you have uh, all the athletic programs, the pursuit of happiness, if you will, going on out there for youth and adult. And so consciously or unconsciously, perhaps people will will relate those two and, and see where the connection really is there. The uh, Veterans Memorial, of course, is located on about a 12 acre section of property on the eastern corner of the 150 acre park. It's uh, one of the areas that was heavily wooded. We did not want to disturb that. Most of the park was clear area, so it was uh, very useful for soccer fields and softball fields, but this particular area had some very uh, nice uh, mature trees and, and uh, a little drainage way through there. And so that was, that was uh, important to preserve, preserve that. The memorial site is, uh, of course, the main memorial has the plaza with the uh, granite wall with the names of the veterans and the statue on top. And then there's the pathway that goes around that uh, memorial. And along that pathway, are individual sites, as you know, for each of the principal wars that the United States has participated in since 1776. Now, that was a big question when our board started working on this, was, okay, well, we'll put up something for every war. Well, what are the wars? And if you look at different uh, resources, you're gonna find different answers to that. Uh, 
So we went to the Army War College, a colleague of uh, our pres present president, General House, and uh, they're at Carlisle Barracks, and they provided what uh, they considered to be the principal wars. There were 17 of those. And we also decided being we are in Texas that Texas Independence should be included on that trail, so it is. So there's 18 sites. Uh, the Veterans Memorial certainly a collaboration. It always has been, always will be. Uh, very, very good collaboration between both the City of College Station, City of Bryan, Brazos County. We received a very good uh, Parks and Wildlife grant to develop the Lynn Stewart Pathway, half mile concrete, fully accessible trail. And uh, numerous local organizations and individuals and uh, in our master plan, we have a list of those that goes on for about a page. Uh, uh, everything from scout groups to local civic organizations to businesses and what have you, but a uh, very fine example of uh, local cooperation. The American Mile ties into this, and of course, the Historic Preservation Committee was instrumental in getting that American Mile project done. And that is a, it's fascinating to go out there. I'm sure you've been out there and, and you see people starting to walk or jog along that and they don't make progress as fast as they think they're going to because they'll stop and they'll be reading, reading these things. But it's a really, really neat concept there. And uh, as I understand, that's something that you're working on to continue that and bring it up to the present and, and fill in some gaps there. But uh, the American Mile, goes in and intersects with the Veterans Memorial and, and uh, a part of that pathway is part of the American Mile so it ties in very nicely. Uh, we have docent tours out there, uh, specifically during the week of uh, Veterans Day. The Ryan Rotary Club does this and does, they do an outstanding job. Have any of you participated in that as a docent or a guide or volunteer? Okay, good. thousand flags out there and so that's one of our we consider our partners because they're helping to do the thing that we really felt the memorial should do is be an educational experience and uh, it is but this takes it to another level and the and the rotary club you know they've got their program put together that's approved by the state board of education so it's an actual when the classes come out there they get credit for that it's not just a happy day type thing. They actually get credit for that, very structured. And uh, they go through, and they don't stop at every site, they stop at about half of them. And uh, it's a very timed exercise to get through there in 50 minutes. So you go to, to a site, and you've got middle school children, middle school age, and you get to, say, the Civil War, and you got three minutes to explain to them what the Civil War is, <laughs> and what it was, or World War II, or Korea and Vietnam, and, and so you start and think, how can you do this? Well, it's, it's pretty quick, and, but, the, but the end result is the kids go out there, they're gonna remember going to this park, they're gonna remember seeing these different statues, they're gonna remember something about that. Hopefully they'll come back and look at it later. Uh, this past uh, week they had 1,390 uh, 1, kids were scheduled to go through that uh, from schools in both school districts. And so that's a remarkable achievement and uh, just a great thing to do. If you ever want to do something happy, go out and volunteer to go out there and help with that. It doesn't take a whole lot of skill and it's organized to where they'll hand you something and, and even I could figure out what I needed to do on that. But it's a great, great program. Good example of uh, how that educational process can work. The main plazas, known as the Lewis L. Adam Memorial Plaza. And uh, Mr. Adam was uh, instrumental in some early contributions on, on the development of this uh, original memorial. The uh, wall now is closing in somewhere around 5,000 names. I don't know exactly the, the exact number, but there was 133 new names that went on this year. The uh, process for doing that you can fill out the form that's at your table. You can go online at the WWBVVM 
www.ingenuity.org website and you can actually do it online with a credit card. And uh, the names are, are simply the person's name and branch of service. There's no rank, no dates of service or anything like that. And the qualification is any of those who have served honorably in the armed forces of the United States from, from 1776 to the present time. And we have people on the wall from American Revolution all the way up to some that are currently serving in uh, far off posts around the world today. But uh, the thing about the names and when you go out there and you look at that and you start looking at the wall, uh, you look up there and invariably you're gonna see somebody you know and sometimes you'll think, well, I didn't know they were a veteran, or maybe you did know they're a veteran, but uh, you start looking and you see these familiar names up there, and then you look at the thousands of names up there. And the thing about the names is each name represents a story. And some of those stories are uh, good, some of them are not so good, but each one represents a story of someone who served in the military forces of the United States at some point period in history. And uh, some of those names uh, are people that did not survive the war. Some of them are people that served in peacetime. And so there's a variety out there. The memorial recognizes six branches of service. Of course, the uh, Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marine. And uh, many people don't re know that the Merchant Marine was actually part of the what would be called the Department of Defense now, but they were part of the military during World War II specifically, and uh, they are recognized on our wall, and we have our, their flag out there as well. And the uh, Merchant Marine, uh, another little trivia item, they actually, in World War II, they had the highest percentage casualty rate of any branch of service uh, in World War II was a Merchant Marine. And it's simply because they were sinking the ships just about as fast as we can make them. But uh, so that's uh, how the, the, the wall is done. The war sites, as I mentioned, there's a total of 18 of these. And each one of those sites, it's uh, intended to be an educational site. There's a bench, a marker, a history panel. And uh, at each of these sites, a, the granite marker simply has the name of, of uh, that war that uh, is recognized by the Department of Defense. The history panel has a narrative of a thousand words or less, some photographs, what have you, and some uh, information about that war. There's a total of 22 of those panels because uh, some of the sites have more than one panel. World War II has three panels, for instance, one for Pacific, one for Europe, and one for the home front. Civil War has two, one for the North and one for the South, etc. Uh, we, we seek sponsorships for some of these. You'll recognize uh, Mr. and Ms. Birdwell there. They were one of our early sponsors, and they sponsored the uh, uh, Confederate site and, uh, in honor of Lawrence Sullivan Ross. Now you'll see the smaller one there. That's uh, a member of our audience, Pat Small. And... Uh, on, I believe that was on World War, I mean, on the American Revolution site. Then the overall site is a sponsorship at $40,000, which pays for the statue, the bench, the marker, the panel, et cetera. And this is just a list of some of the contributors, not all of them, uh, different people that have come up and contributed uh, for whatever reason. Um, in, the, in the Korean War, we actually did two statues, and, and the approach we took on that uh, General House uh, was close friends with uh, uh, Korean businessmen and, and uh, General Pak from South Korea. And we broached the idea if they would pay for the American statue, we'd pay for the Korean statue. And they latched onto that and, and they exceeded whatever it was we were trying to do. And uh, General Pak, who at that time was 92 years old, and uh, not in the best of health, came from Korea to that dedication for the uh, uh, Korean War Memorial dedication. And that particular ceremony was actually covered by Korean national TV uh, of the ceremony that went on here in College Station. So it's a great, great deal. 
So some of the sites that have been completed, uh, the global war on terror, uh, if you've been out there, you, you recognize the beam from one of the World Trade Centers, and uh, that's the uh, primary part of that. That was dedicated back in 2005. And when you look at those panels, uh, they all, while they're all different, they all have a, a, a uniform format to them. And up in the left corner is the president or presidents at the time of that particular war. There's a banner across the top with the uh, official name of that war and the years. In, the case, in this case, it's still going on. And uh, then on the right, there's a little sort of a global map that shows some of the locations where the war took place. There's a list of uh, who the combatants were or are, what the casualties were, uh, pictures of uh, various leaders or, or soldiers who, or sailors or service members who served in that, what their equipment looked like, uh, perhaps airplanes or rifles or whatever. And uh, the ribbon at the top, if you look at the coloration on that ribbon, it, it serves as a purpose too because that's the color of the battle of the war streamer for that particular war. In this case, it's a uh, combination of blue and green and red. And that streamer coloration uh, translates directly to the ribbon that uh, the service member wears for participation in that war. And so any of you that served in a combat area, you have a service ribbon for that uh, service. And it is related to the war streamer that is recognized for that war. Who, who decides that? Who, the Defense Department? Defense Department yes. determines that? Yes. And they went back in history. Has there always been one? Um, Congress in the, I, I don't believe there was one originally. And in some cases, like American Revolution, we just use red, white, and blue for that. But uh, certainly they go back uh, to the Civil War. And, and I'll mention that. That's, I'll, I'll mention something interesting about that one. Uh, American Revolution, again, this one just has a red and white uh, streamer on that. Uh, this was dedicated in 2010, Liberty or Death. All of, our, all of these statues, with the exception of the original, have been done by J. Payne Laura, uh, a local artist who's done a lot of work in, the, in this community, in this area. Uh, downtown Bryan, for ex example, and uh, different statues here in College Station. And uh, he's the one that's done all of these statues. Uh, one thing about the statues is they are all historically accurate, life-size uh, representative art. And the purpose is, particularly you see this when those kids come out there, uh, one of the teaching moments is they'll, the t the, whoever's got the, that particular site will say, well, come up here and look at this statue. And, this was, this was his canteen, or this was his uh, uh, kit. This is the type of musket they had. And so uh, when the kids look at it, they can relate to, okay, this is what they looked like back then, and, and they're all life-size, they're all at ground level. So it puts you on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with that statue. And it's a very good educational tool. Uh, Texas Independence. Uh, this is another one. Uh, this come and take it. It was dedicated on October 2nd, which was Battle of Gonzales. And uh, we did that on the, uh, 100, I believe, 175th anniversary of Battle of Gonzales. And, uh, of course, those guys, they just wore whatever they had. They really didn't have uniforms to speak of. They brought what they had from home and went after it. Uh, one thing we did at the Texas Independence site uh, there's a little marker out there on the ground. If you go out there and look at it, it says sacred ground or sacred soil. We went with permission and collected very small samples of soil from San Jacinto, Washington on the Brazos, Alamo, Gonzales, and uh, Goliad. And then had, when we did the dedication ceremony, we had a reenactors come out and they had their old muskets and they scattered that you know, one at a time, those little bits of soil out there. So it's one of the only places that, probably the only place that you can go that there's actual 
small bits of soil from those historic sites and Texas history in one place. Uh, the Korean War, it's uh, catchy capsi die. We go together. Korean War was unique in that uh, the two sides were fighting together. And uh, in that case, they actually had tank crews where you'd have uh, three Americans and one Korean in a tank, or three Koreans and one American in their tank. And, Everything was integrated to that point to where it was very much a joint effort. And uh, uh, like I say, it was dedicated in 2010. Pacific uh, Theater for World War II, dedicated in 2011. Uh, we got permission to use a likeness of uh, George Bush in his uh, naval aviation uniform and gear. And this one's Day of Infamy. I got cut off there for some reason. But Day of Infamy. And uh, it appears he's, you know, walking around his aircraft, getting ready to take off, maybe doing a pre-flight, maybe looking at somebody else that's just taken off. And uh, very good statue there. And then we also, uh, they all, the artist actually went out and looked at some of the archives there at the museum, some of the equipment and what have you to make sure he got everything accurate. The, the little flight board that's, he's carrying and those type of things. Uh, this was dedicated in 2012, War of 1812, 200th anniversary of the War of 1812. Uh, don't give up the ship. Navy had a prominent role in that, of course. Uh, this particular statue, if you look at the, the sailors barefoot, and as many of them were back in those days, they, they, they were barefoot. And, um, this, uh, actually there was, there was a Prominent Brazos County resident was a War of 1812 veteran. Does anybody know who that was? Richard Carter. And so uh, his name is on the wall now, and it was put on this year. But Richard Carter was a veteran of the War of 1812, which is pretty interesting because Richard Carter at one time owned the land that uh, Veterans Park and Athletic Complex is located on. So his name ended up on a monument in what was formerly his land. A little trivia there. And the creek that runs through it. And the creek that runs through it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the second one is a European theater, Letters from Home. That's somehow, I'm getting cut off on that side. But Letters from Home. And uh, this was, this one was, dead, was uh, sponsored by the Allen family and uh, in honor of Mr. C.J. Allen. Many of you remember him. And he was in World War II in Europe and it's entitled Letters from Home. It's a representation of, of him re reading a letter sitting there on the wall. And if you go out there, take a little time and go over there and look and you can read that letter. It's actually inscribed on the other side. And what that letter is, is a letter to Mr. Allen from his father that he received when he was in Europe during the war. And uh, it's very short, it's just a little one page letter, but it's actually inscribed on, on the uh, other side of that little tablet that he's holding there. And so you can read the actual letter. Of course, Vietnam, it was dedicated this last May 31st, and uh, this is part of the uh, 50th anniversary commemoration of the Vietnam War. We were uh, sanctioned as part of that overall nation, nationwide uh, process. And uh, had a, did any of you, were any of you here out there for the dedication? So, I mean, it was, it was a, I think we had about a thousand people out there. And uh, the featured speaker was the president of the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association and did a wonderful job really told a good tale and Vietnam you know one of the things about that is it's recognized as a helicopter war and all of us remember that uh, part of that ceremony at the uh, appropriate time it was timed and uh, fortunately it all came off just right and when the speaker was talking about the helicopters and some of his experiences and he was mentioning about the sound of that 
Huey helicopters, very distinct, not like the ones you hear nowadays, but very distinct. And uh, as he said that, sure enough, here comes over the trees a restored Huey helicopter that had been retained for this ceremony, and it that fella did a pretty good job of bringing it in. I mean, he was he was hard charging and did a pretty steep bank, and somehow or another made the circle and landed on the soccer field over there. So it was a not a dry in the crowd, and it was a great ceremony. This one was actually a little more ambitious than most of our uh, memorials. And what, another little interesting fact there is nobody, including the artist or anybody else, had seen this thing all together until it went up on that wall. And so you know, everybody's kind of hoping that all these pieces that they had to cast separately would fit together and end up looking right, and it did. And uh, the helicopter that was part of that ceremony was actually a marine helicopter. And uh, I, of course, I couldn't tell the difference, but it was a restored marine helicopter that actually came in during that ceremony. But uh, so this, this was uh, our latest effort, and this was about a $150,000 project start to finish. So it was a little, a little more than our normal one. So this is, uh, this is kind of where we are. The ones in red are the ones that have not been done. The ones in black have been completed. So you can see we got some work to do. Remember those dates I asked you to write down or remember? One of them is July 4th of uh, 2026, okay? That is the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, okay? That's what significant. Our goal as a board is to have all those black, all those red ones turn black by the time we get to July 4th, 17, or 2026. Have them all done in time for the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. We do have some uh, memorabilia in the event that you would be interested in that. Our little miniature statues, we have some of those that we have available for sale. The one with two figures, of course, or more. If you would like a reproduction of any of those panels out there, we have those that uh, we can print for you. And so what's next? Well, that second, that other date I told you, April 9th, 2015, is when we're going to dedicate the Civil War site. And the significance of April 9th is that will be the 150th anniversary of Appomattox was not the last battle of the Civil War, but effectively uh, is the, the, the end of the war. We plan to do Indian War, which will be entitled Buffalo Soldier in 2016. Uh, the Mexican War in 2017, that'll be a Marine, Marine statue. There are very few Marines in that particular war, but their song starts with Halls of Montezuma, and that's where it came from. So it'll be a Marine. And then uh, World War I will be in 2018. That'll be the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And there's some commemorative activities that are already starting to take place regarding World War I. And uh, you'll see more and more of these over the next few years. So this is very important that we get that done. And once we get those four, there'll be seven remaining sites to do after these four. So the Civil War site, I'll talk about that. There is a conceptual plan on your table there. Please take that with you. If you don't want it, give it to somebody else. Uh, this gives a little narrative about that, what it's going to look like. And on the reverse is the plaque narrative that will be on the monument there. And the theme of this, this particular one is going home. And do you know since this we're doing this on the anniversary of Appomattox and the focus of this particular memorial is going to be not a certain battle uh, being fought or what anything like that these particular statues are going to represent a confederate soldier who is heading home towards the south and a union soldier who's heading home towards the north and as you see them, they'll appear to be 
crossing each other or, or passing by each other and kind of a, a moment of whether they're thinking whether they need to shoot at each other or just wave and let it go. And uh, one will be on one side of the, the uh, picket fence out there and one will be on the other side. And uh, so it's going to be a pretty neat, pretty neat statue, a little bit different from uh, most memorials you might see. Uh, we hope to be able to raise enough money to buy a replica of a Napoleon cannon, uh, the old big wheel spoke cannons that were uh, used by both sides of the, during the Civil War. And uh, if we can get that, we will. Uh, we've currently raised about uh, $72,000. Uh, both cities have contributed. The Brazos County has contributed. Uh, we've gotten numerous contributions from individuals and, and uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans have been a prominent role in helping raise some of that money. So we're well on the way there with this one. The uh, Confederate statue has actually went to the foundry this week. Uh, it's complete. We did it first because we were using private funds to get the Confederate statue put together. Uh, the cities and county are providing the funds for the Union statue. and. Uh, so work will begin now immediately on the Union sculpture. Uh, one thing about the, and I was going to mention this, uh, you know, those service ribbons that we were talking about, those panels. Uh, for the Confederate panel, the ribbon is a, a gray over blue ribbon. The Union is a blue over gray. Same colors, just reversed both of which are recognized by Department of Defense. So if you go out and look at that panel, it's a very small detail, but uh, if you look at it, you'll see that. Both the same color, reversed order. And, uh, but this one will be at noon on Thursday, April 12th, and uh, we're going to have some reenactors. April 9th. April 9th, excuse me, oh. April 9th, yeah. And, uh, There'll be some reenactors out there. We uh, are seeking letters from actual uh, soldiers during that war that we might be able to read a part of those during the ceremony. Uh, we hope to do some other things and perhaps have some music and what have you out there. Uh, we're also looking at the possibility of having a living history event at that site that following weekend and uh, have uh, reenactors from Union and Confederate and what have you out there on the site. Just starting to work on that. This is our website. If you want to go on there and you can get all the information there. If you want to donate, you can do that. You can get on Facebook with us. And uh, 2026. Uh, we had uh, set a goal last year of $520,000 was our estimate to do all these things. Of course, that's kind of a moving number because uh, uh, somebody decided we wanted to have a cannon, so that put a little extra money in there and that kind of thing. But uh, actually, we were, we've already achieved some of that, so I have no doubt we're going to get there. Now. I was going to have you do three things for me. Number one, if you haven't already done it, go out there and walk that trail and look at this and look at those panels and just read something on, you know, you learn something new every time you go out there. But uh, go out there and look at that trail and look at those panels and, and think about uh, what they represent and what the service and sacrifice uh, was for those people. 200 years ago, and those people today. Then number two, consider putting someone's name on the wall if you have not done so, or if you have done so, consider and put somebody else on there. Uh, friend, relative, worker, co-worker, and uh, it's a great way to honor them. The deadline is August the 15th each year, and there's a fee of $100, which at this point does not quite cover the cost. So we, we, we subsidize that to a certain extent. But uh, the deadline's August 15th, and that 
gives us enough time for the engraver to justify the template and do all the things they have to do and then actually go out and get the get those names on there. Like I say, we did 133 this year. And then the last thing, and this is most important, tell somebody else about the Veterans Memorial. Take this material, hand it to them, encourage them to go out there. Because one of our really important goals has been to try to get this word out about what we did consider the, the one of the best kept secrets in Brazos Valley is this memorial. It's a great asset, great asset, and uh, not many people knew about it. I think that's changing though, because we did get some very good coverage this year for our ceremony at the Vietnam Memorial, for the Vietnam dedication as well as the Veterans Day ceremony. So I think that's changing, but that last thing I would like you to do is go out and tell one other person about the Brazos Valley Veteran Memorial, and if they hadn't been out there, encourage them to go out there and walk around and take a look at it. Take all these things with you because I don't want to take them back. Yes. Sir.